this may be seated you guys may definitely be seated i'm gonna jump right into this because well frankly i have a long passage of scripture only 78 verses and uh then we'll wrap up no i'm kidding so we've started a new series or a series of conversations entitled the rebuild say the rebuild and it's very apropos because we are in a stage where we are rebuilding. We're rebuilding. And last week, DJ brought the fire and he was talking about having a heart for the cause, having a heart for the people of God. And it moved me. It challenged me. Where is my heart? What moves my heart? And I pray that today there's another alignment. You know, when you go to the chiropractor and they just and they get all the bones in, in line. So you can walk upright, so you can walk straight, so you can do everything that you would typically do. And so today, I, I pray that today you are encouraged and truthfully that you're challenged. Because we don't come here to hear a, a sweet word. We don't come here to hear a pretty word. It says that the word of God is like a double-edged sword. Cutting between bone and marrow. So to catch us up, we, we went through Nehemiah 1 where Nehemiah entered King Artaxerxes' presence very unhappy and he noticed this and asked him what was going on and Nehemiah has a heart for Jerusalem which is now at this point destroyed. There are people living there but there's no walls. There's nothing there and so he asked the king for resources. He asked if he has permission of safe passage and the king grants it to him. He's moved by people that he's never met personally, that he's never seen, because he's been in Persia this whole time. So what we're going to jump into today is Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you. Anybody got a paper Bible? Any paper Bible people? There we go. Yeah, just wave it around. I like to hear the, the paper pages so we're in nehemiah 3 starting in verse 1 and i apologize for my humanity but there are some names that are in this passage that are they're excellent i love them so i'm gonna read and if i mess it up don't make fun of me please all right nehemiah 3 starting in verse 1 eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate they dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the Tower of Hananel. Now at this point, the building is beginning. The resources are gotten, Nehemiah has gotten people on board and they're starting to build, okay? The men of Jericho built the adjoining section and Zakur, son of Emery, built next to them. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah, that's how, or Hassanah, depending on how you want to say it, they laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired the next section. Next to him, say next to him, and next to him, Meshelam, son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezabel, made repairs. And next to him, say next to him, and next to him, Zadok, son of Banna, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to work under their supervision. Hmm. The Jashana gate was repaired by Joida, son of Pasea, and Meshelam, son of Bezadei, rather. They laid its beams and put its doors with their bolts and bars in place. Next to them, say next to them. Trust me, it's for a reason. And next to them, repairs were made by the men from Gibeon and Mizpah, or Mizpah, rather. Melatiah of Gibeon and Jadon of Maranoth, places under the authority of the governor of the trans-Euphrates. Uzael, son of Harahiah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. And Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, anybody like perfume out there? Yes, yes. One of the perfume makers repaired the 
part of the wall next to them. They restored the Jerusalem wall as far as the broad wall. And Rephaniah, son of Hur, ruler of a half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Jedediah, son of Haramath, repair, made repairs opposite his house. And Hattush, uh, son of Hashabniah, made repairs next to him. Malchijah, son of Haram, and Hashab, son of Pehath Moab, repaired another section and the tower of the ovens. Shalem, son of Halohesh, ruler of a half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. Father God, we thank you for your word. God, I pray that it would enlighten. God, that it would shine a light into our lives. God, I pray that people would leave with a better understanding of you, challenged and ready to put their hands to work for this rebuild. We thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, Junior. Can we give it up for Junior, please? Thank you. You're amazing. So tonight, what we're going to be talking about is some things that can get in the way of a rebuild. See, we're at this point where they're rebuilding this wall. And there are some things that could not go with them in the rebuild. There are some things that just can't be if you're trying to do any good work of God. But before we get into that, a lot of us notice that, that look, look to your left, look to your right. Some of y'all didn't look, I see y'all. So if you look to your left and look to your right, there are some differences that probably distinguish you from the person next to you. There's a lot of differences that we see all across society. There's differences of gender. There's differences of, you know, things like politics, things of, of race. And one of the things that I think is, is most important is uh, the difference between if you're a person who allows pineapple on their pizza or if you think that it does not belong on pizza. And just in case you guys were wondering, I do have the consensus vote. Pineapple does not go on top of pizza. Can we give it up for Chef Gordon Ramsay? Thank you so much for speaking the truth. Man, hallelujah, amen. We can have an altar call and go home. No, I'm kidding. So there are lots of differences that we have amongst even ourselves as believers. And the truth is, when you look in the story of Nehemiah, there are some differences between all of these individuals that we named, and bless their names there. So I'm not naming my child any of those. But something that we have to realize is that our differences can be a hindrance to any good work of God. See, our differences can be any a hindrance, rather, to any good work of God. And one thing in our first point for tonight, which is entitled Rise from the Rubble. Rise from the Rubble, if you're taking notes. The first point of tonight's message is this. When we put our differences aside, we rise. When we put our differences aside, aside we rise and I want to just look at the scripture really quickly just to get an overview we're not saying any names again but if you notice there are lots of different types of people in this there's a goldsmith there's a perfume maker there's a ruler of a half district there's a son a few sons and there are daughters see when you look at this there's not too much that they have in common other than the fact that they're all in the same place, in the same struggle. Same place, in the same struggle. And our differences are not supposed to push us apart. They're actually supposed to bring us together. See, differences are not meant to divide us. They're meant to unite us. Our differences aren't something to just separate us and distinguish us from each other. They're meant to be celebrated. There's a psychologist, Scott Pack, that says, share our simula similarities and celebrate our differences. Yeah. See, different isn't really bad. Yeah. Nothing's wrong with being different. But 
One thing is that even if we're different, we have to be unified in one mind and of one heart. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly united in one mind and one thought. See, when you're in one mind and of one thought, you're mission-minded. When you're in one mind and of one thought, you're able to look at one singular thing and work together collectively at this one thing. Differences should be celebrated. Paul even says it in Romans. He says that we all have different gifts. We're all gifted differently. Some may have the gift of teaching, and if you have it, teach. If you have the gift of encouragement, which some of you do, Nelson, I know you for a fact have the gift of encouragement. If that's your gift, encourage. If your gift is giving, then give. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, teach, etc. like I said. Whatever it is, do it diligently. But nowhere in this passage does it say that if you were to teach, exclusively teach. There's nowhere in this passage does it say if your gift is encouragement, just just stick to encouragement and go ahead. Keep, keep on that, that pathway. See, the, the truth is, rendezvous, that your gifting doesn't matter if you aren't doing what God has called you to do. See, God calls us to more than just what we're gifted in. God calls us to more than what he's put inside of us. Sometimes we have to break those barriers down and those walls that we've boxed ourselves in to see a great work of God come to play. See, if we get caught up in our differences, we could truly miss the bigger picture. If our differences divide us, then the wall is never built. If, if their differences were to divide them in Jerusalem, the wall would have never been built. Why is this? Well, I have an image of what Nehemiah's Jerusalem looked like and the sections that each person built. We don't have to have the words there. So when it comes up on the screen, you'll actually see the names of each individual that built each section of the wall. As you see in the top left, it says the Sheep Gate. That's where it started and it was built counterclockwise. But what I like about this particular diagram is that it shows the fullness of what was done, but you also see that this is a bunch or a series of little walls. You'll get it in a second. This is a series of, of individual walls. See, this isn't just a corporate wall. This is a bunch of little sections that make up the wall that surrounds Jerusalem. See, if you're not building your section of the wall, then I'm just as open to the attack as you are because you're not doing your part. So I'm standing idly by laying brick by brick, and guess what? You're sitting back drinking lemonade. Do you not understand that we have a wall to build? We are at the same vulnerability. What are you doing? Why are your hands not at work? No, we have to set our differences aside and put our hands to work. I'm not going to let the enemy get to me because of you. I'm not going to allow myself to be vulnerable because you choose to look at our differences instead of working together. It's a bunch of different pieces of the wall but if you're building your part and I'm building my part the wall gets built I'm not gonna let the enemy use you to get to me I'm not I'm gonna continue because of time and what I love about this story is that there are some things that happen in the passage that just baffle me like it, it just doesn't make sense to me 
And there's, there's a specific individual that I kind of scoffed at as I was reading. But the point is this, and we'll go into the story in a second. It's, it's when we put our pride aside, we rise. So the first thing is when we put our differences aside, we can rise and work together. Because our differences actually complement each other. As we are all a body, there are different parts. You may be the finger. I may be the pinky toe. Guess what? We're all a part of the body and we all have our function. Differences are supposed to be. But pride? It's got to go. See, sometimes people think too highly of themselves to do the dirty work. To put their hands down and to pick up a brick and start to build the good work that God has. Pride will actually destroy everything that you're building up. It'll destroy it all. Proverbs says it like this. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. With humility comes wisdom. It also says in, in chapter 16 that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Pride has to be put aside. We can't have it go with us to where we're going. Pride will corrupt anything that you're trying to advance into. And, and truthfully, pride just also has the other side where it can make you miss out on something that's bigger than you. Another way to, to say that is what I'm a part of is bigger than the part that I play. I'm going to say it again. What I'm a part of collectively is bigger than the role or the part that I personally play. We see this same concept in Nehemiah. In verse 5, it says this. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa. But, what does it say? It says their nobles would not put their shoulders to work under their supervisors. Hmm. Why do, you, why do you think that is that they didn't want to put their shoulder to work under their supervisors? They're nobles. They felt like they didn't have to. There's this elitist mentality where, you know, I'm, I'm going to let them build it. I'm, I'm going to let them keep doing it because I rule. I have enough money. I have the resources. I get to call the shots. It's entitlement. But, but look at this at the beginning of chapter 3. It says, Eliashib, which is the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. I'm going to stop there. So there are a lot of duties of the high priest. The high priest has a lot of jobs. And I can assure you, building a wall is not one of them. He has duties that are specific to the temple. There are lots of things that you have to do in the temple that you can't really be dirty for. You can't. You need to stay clean. You need to be able to do your duties. But what I find is interesting is that if anybody had an excuse to not build this wall, it would have been him. It would have been him. He had a whole set of other duties to do. But the truth is, if he saw it as a good work to be done, he decided, you know what? I'm going to roll my sleeves up and I'm going to put my hands to work. He saw that there was a good work to be done. And so he worked. See, some of us are, are kind of scared to get our hands dirty. We don't want to, but truthfully, if I'm looking to build something, if I'm looking for, let's say if you're looking for a mechanic, right? Somebody to work on your car. I have an old car. It's a 93 Chevy. Love that baby. Adeline. She's out there in the lot. Yes, I named my car Adeline. So the truth is, if I'm looking for a mechanic or if I'm looking for somebody to build something for me, or if I'm trying to verify the validity of somebody who says they do that sort of thing. I don't look for a badge. I don't look for a name tag. I don't look for 
the most qualified looking person, if they look good, I'm not like, oh man, yeah, you look good, so work on my car. That's not, that's not how it works. Something that I look for is their fingernails. I have to look at their fingernails. I need to see your hands. Why? Because if you got soft hands like me, you're not working. If you don't have dirt under your fingernails, then you have not been putting any work in. I need to see people who have been putting work in. People who are not scared to get dirt under their fingernails. Elisha was not scared to get dirty. Why? Because there's work to be done. When there's work to be done, it doesn't matter what shoes you came in with. It doesn't matter what outfit you wore. It doesn't matter if your edges are laid. It doesn't matter if your nails just got done. Guess what? The work has to be done. It has to be. The wall has to get built. And if you see the work that needs to be done and you don't do it, You're just as bad as the people who are mocking the work itself. You've chosen your side. You stand idly by. Oh, that's nice, yeah. Yeah, that's good, yeah. No, no, turn the brick this way, it's it's better. You know the people who who tell you to do something a certain way and they they don't want to get their hands, there was one time I I was working on my car and I was trying to get my battery out and it was a messy situation and I had black all over my hands. I had black all over my hands. It just, it just happened that way. And somebody came out to my car and they're like, hey, what you doing? I was like, I'm, I'm getting the battery out of my car. And they had the audacity. <laughs> they had the nerve. <laughs> Say, hey, have you tried to, uh, have you tried like turn it this way, do it like this? It's like, oh, show me how to do it. And they're like, oh, no, 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 it's cool. It's cool, you got it. They're wearing white. They had a white t-shirt on like I do today. They did in their defense. But if you're really trying to help, don't talk about it. Help me. Don't just say I'm going to, don't tell me how to do it. Be a part of the process because you'll miss out on the miracle of the rebuild. What's the miracle of the rebuild? I'll tell you. Guys, the the wall was built in 52 days. The wall was built in 52 days. I have to help you understand the spectrum. See, Jerusalem was now in exile after 70 years, and now the, the walls are built in 52 days? After 70 years, the wall was built in 52 days. There's nothing but God that could have made that happen. It's 52 days after years of not having any protection, after years of shame, after years of desolation. You'll miss the miracle if you try to be too cute. We're not here to be cute. I understand. I love your edges. I love the new weave. We're not here to be cute. We're here to build. We're here to build a good work. And if you're going to be a part of it, get some dirt under your fingernails. I don't want to miss the miracle. I don't. (sighs) Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Last but not least, we have, if we set our differences aside, we rise. We can build a wall if we can put our differences aside. See, clicks can't go where God's trying to take us. Our, our preferences can't go where God's trying to take us. What we think should be the case can't go where God's trying to take us. If we see this as a good work, we have to be willing to just go all in. We got to set our differences aside, our different agendas, our different opinions. And secondly, we have to set our pride aside. We can't have the hat of pride because it will blind us from being a part of something great. We can't. And it'll affect those around you. But lastly, if the structure 
is sturdy, we rise. If the structure is sturdy, we rise. We read last week in Nehemiah 2 that he requested timber from the field to be able to build the gates to the wall. So every gate, there was wood that was necessary to build it. Notice he didn't ask for gold. He didn't ask for gold. He didn't ask for diamonds to put his name on it. Nehemiah's house. He didn't do that. He didn't ask for silver. He didn't ask for bronze. He didn't ask for any of those things. He asked for something that would be sturdy and that would stand the test of time. And something that I didn't get to read today, but I want to note is that Nehemiah, once he got the order to be able to rebuild this wall, he went back to do just that. And in Nehemiah 2, it says this, I I went to Jerusalem and after staying there for three days, I had set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. There were no mounts except for me, the one I was riding on. By night, I went through the valley gate toward the jackal gate and the dung gate, examining, say examining, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. I then moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. That means that there was so much rubble that he could not even ride into where he was trying to get to. If we fast forward to Nehemiah 4, and I don't, I don't even have it. I wasn't, I wasn't going to read it. God, all right. So in Nehemiah 4, and I promise it'll all make sense in a second. In Nehemiah 4, he says, in verse 10, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble, we cannot rebuild the wall. So Nehemiah goes and he inspects the integrity of the wall and sees that there's a ton of rubble. But clearly in the passage we just read, the wall began to be built. How is that possible with with so much rubble? How is that possible with so much around the wall? And, And you have to consider this. The wall was destroyed. The gates were burned by fire. But what I think Nehemiah was looking at was the foundation. What I think Nehemiah was looking for was to see if he were to build this good work of God, if he was to build this wall around Jerusalem, what does the foundation look like? And do we have to do as Ezra did and pour the foundation again? But this passage clearly shows me that the foundation did not have to be rebuilt. The foundation was strong enough. What is your foundation on? What is it built on? Do you find yourself, if you were to truly inspect your life, what what is your foundation built upon? As the band comes back up, I have a, a quick story. My dad is an architect and when I was growing up with him something that we would do is we would do a lot of different community service projects and um, one community service project that we would do is that of Habitat for Humanity. Has anybody heard of Habitat for Humanity? So they go out and they build these houses and there's something that I learned even at a young age from being a part of these different rebuilds and and things like that. One thing that I I noticed is that when you're building something, the foundation has to be poured first. It has to be. And then you build upward. You build with the beams, etc. And then you get to make the house look like a house and it gets some structure and then you get to make it look pretty. But one thing that I learned is that If your foundation is cracked, 
if your foundation is cracked, then that means that you at some point down the road are going to end up with roofing issues. If anybody's ever done a restoration of a house or anything like that, you're going to have roofing issues because your foundation is, is out of line. And ultimately, whatever structure that you've built, the integrity is now compromised. That's how a lot of buildings get condemned. That's how a lot of buildings end up, parts of it imploding on itself. Because the foundation finds itself cracked. It, it wasn't as sturdy as they thought it would be. And when your foundation is not solid, it creates these, these roofing issues. You'll have leaking and you'll have all types of, of problems. So if a storm comes, your house will start to, to have mildew and mold. And, and I want to ask you, what's leaking into your life because of your foundation? What are you allowing to leak into your life because of the foundation that you've built it on? Have you built your life on the opinions of others because the opinions of others change have you built your life foundation on on the latest fad well fads fade it's here today and gone tomorrow what have you built your life on have you built it on what your parents think or expect of you have you built it on a degree path or a career choice. What have you built your life on? See, here at the rendezvous, if you look through the rubble of change and the rubble of things that have gone on, guess what? Our foundation is still the same. Jesus is still our message. People are still our heart. Though the looks of it may change, guess what? Our foundation is firm because we've built it upon the rock of Jesus Christ. What is your life built upon? I just want you to ask yourself, consider it. And don't just say Jesus because you think it's Jesus. Be honest with yourself because the only person that you're fooling is yourself. God can see the heart of man so you can look me in the eyes and say, no, I've, I've known Jesus all my life, but is your foundation on him? If everything went to waste, if the fires of life burned everything away, if the enemy came and took everything away, would you be able to rebuild on what's still there, which is Jesus? I implore you, if your foundation is not built upon Jesus, if your life is not built upon the rock, it's never going to stay standing. It may stand for a little while, maybe even a long while, but there will come a day when everything goes to waste and you have nothing. If you had nothing but Jesus, would you still be okay? If you didn't have the shoes on your feet and the clothes on your back would you still be okay if you had Jesus I love that you're saying yes but it's about what's in your heart see this this word was was very challenging for me this word was very challenging for me because it caused me to have to to look at myself and see what differences I'm holding between people what what pride do I have in my life that I need to set aside so this great work can happen this great work called rendezvous what wall are you called to build well if you feel like you don't have a wall it's this here thing called rendezvous we're all in this together it may start with one vision but Nehemiah needed everybody all hands on deck to get the wall built there's a phrase that says to reach everybody we need everybody that includes the the seats that are empty i know some of you have looked around and seen that there's seats in between you those were supposed to be filled 
What are you doing? Yeah. Why didn't you pick up a brick? Right. It's your wall. This isn't just my wall, this is your wall. If there's an empty seat next to you, then you need to be the reason why it's filled next week. If there's something that you see wrong in this place, this is your ministry. This isn't just my ministry. This isn't just the team's ministry. This is Rendezvous, the place where we meet with God. The place where young adults can be free. A place where young adults can find purpose. I dare you, if you see a problem here, an issue here, then you have to be a part of the solution. You have to be. Because the wall is depending on you. Yeah, yeah. I can't build it by myself. I can't build it with just the people who are standing. Yeah. It takes each and every one of you to rebuild this to the good work that God intended it to be. So if you believe this is a good work, it's time to get to work. You guys may be seated with every head bowed and every eye closed around this place. Nobody looking around, please.